There's a thing called Lectio Divina. Mm -hmm. Now, what is that? It means divine reading is the literal translation. It's right. a Latin expression. The, uh, the emergent church people have to have some form of spirituality, some religion here. They, they can fix the planet, but there has to be a, a dimension, a spiritual dimension of some kind. So what is that going to be? And, and that has increasingly become some form of mysticism. In contemplative prayer, uh, you have a mystical form of praying. In Lectio Divina, you have a mystical form of reading Scripture. So the individual approaches Scripture not for the understanding the content of the Word of God, but to have an experience with God through the Bible. So the, the whole purpose has changed from understanding Scripture and letting the, that understanding change our lives to having some kind of an experience with God. So Electro Divina has, it goes back to uh, uh, the Roman Catholic Church from years ago. It was in the monasteries and has come up through the ages and was mainly stayed in the Roman Catholic realms for, for centuries. But uh, when Richard Foster began to write his literature and bringing uh, the mystics into the Protestant Celebration of Discipline. Though. Celebration of Discipline right. is his major book. When he began to do that, he introduced to the evangelical community uh, these types of things, uh, like the Old Divina, contemplative prayer, all sorts of mystical practices. And uh, that kind of took off slowly in evangelicalism, but with the coming of the emergent church and a few other things, it has really taken off the last decade. So that everywhere you turn anymore, books of all kinds, uh, movements of all kinds, all sorts of denominations are, are now implementing what used to be Roman Catholic practices into uh, their system of, of belief and, and ritual. Plus it's been emerging, you know, I mean, Thomas Merton was one of the leaders that did this. Um, mm -hmm. I remember his autobiography was Seven Story Mountain. Of course, he has a whole series of books. Right. And he passed away in 1968, but he began to merge then Buddhist ideas with Christian mysticism as right. well. So is, is there a lot of this crossover? There's crossover because the mysticism, although there are some distinctions, there's a lot of a lot of similarities in how mysticism works right, in, right. Any, in any religion. Right. They, all, they all have the same steps. But the, so the mysticism has really permeated. Uh, matter of fact, it's hard to pick up an evangelical book anymore and not read about some mystic. It just has become fashionable. It's a fad of the moment, and, uh, and people are really buying into these things. It's, it, comes, it, it has this feel of real spirituality. Somehow you're encountering God in a unique way in Scripture beyond the rationale, beyond the written word, you are encountering God. Same thing with prayer. It, prayer, uh, contemplative prayer, you, it's beyond our thinking apparatus. It's an experience. And this, and again, this fits well with our younger generation that wants an experience. They're not as interested in theology as they are experience, so it fits well. That brings us to another issue, though, and that is the uh, ancient future faith yeah, movement. Glad you Maybe we should that. bring that yeah. in right here. Right. Again, I, I don't think you can live on mystical experience alone uh, and, and have some claim to Christianity. And so there's now a kind of a parallel movement that is now kind of integrating with the emergent church uh, known as the ancient future faith movement. Robert mm -hmm. Weber was probably the father of that movement although uh, Richard Foster, once again, has a lot to do with it. And in this movement, this, uh, this takes on a lot of the issues of, the, of mysticism, a lot of those things, but also it's, it's, taking, uh, it's, it's rolling in the practices, again, of the more liturgical Roman Catholic system and the Eastern Orthodox system, and uh, using a lot of these practices, these what they call ancient practices, and going back to those kinds of rituals, those kinds of forms of religion uh, uh, and worship that uh, has been around the, the Orthodox and the, and the Catholic circles for, for generations, and now rolling those into the more evangelical realm. McLaren says, you know, if, if the church is off base, and, it's, it's, and it is, he believes, then what better than to go back to the ancient times and, and use those practices? And so the ancient future faith movement goes back to, to the second century through the seventh century, and they say that was the most purest form of Christianity that we've ever seen. So we are, we've lost our way in the 21st century. Let's go back to the, this earlier uh, classical time 
they call it, and let's, uh, let's take those views and those practices and let's bring them into our church today. Right. Uh, pretty much out of time here. Right? That's what we always say in radio and television because it, it comes down to that. Any yeah. closing thoughts, Pastor Gilly? Well, I think we need to, uh, once again, if I could really bring it together, especially as a pastor, is what we need to do is get back to, once again, to the true study of the Scriptures. Uh, the postmodern world has uh, said that's not important, but God says it's important. And I think the real issue is that we no longer understand the Word of God very well. We haven't studied it. We haven't taught our children. We haven't taught our teenagers. We, our youth groups often in our churches are uh, this big group of having fun and, and wonderful rock music and no scriptural content. We've got to get back to the Word of God. We've got to get back to doing what the church does best, which is to teach God's truth to this generation of people. And uh, unless we do that, we're just, uh, we're just wide open to anything that comes along. Any, any doctrinal fad that can rock the boat is going to do so. Churches need to take serious again the teaching of God's Word. God needs to have the first and the last word in our lives. Pastor Gary Gilly, thank you very much for your time here on the program. You know, uh, a lot of us think that the purpose Jesus came was to try to help us get to heaven after we die. Well, I'd like to raise some serious questions about that based on the New Testament. I'd like to suggest Jesus didn't come here to tell us how to get to heaven after we die primarily. He came to talk to us about how the kingdom of heaven can happen here on earth while we're here and when our children or our grandchildren are here. Uh, maybe what we should do is we should get Jesus to uh, edit the Lord's Prayer. So we should edit the Lord's Prayer to sound more like the way we think. It should say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May we go to heaven after we die. May we leave here and go to your kingdom in heaven, which is unlike earth, because there your will is done. But that's not what the, the Lord's Prayer says. It says, May your kingdom come here. May your will be done down here on earth as it is in heaven. Very different understanding of what Jesus is about when we see his message centered on the kingdom. But what does that mean? What does the kingdom of God mean? Well, it, it changes the way you look at people who are different. You stop rich, look at the poor in a different way. The poor look at the rich in a different way. Uh, people look at people of other races and other religions in a different way. You can't look at someone of a different political party the same way and be be faithful to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God makes you look at creation in a different way. You look at the trees and the sky and the air and the water in a different way. This is now my father's world. It's my father's uh, beautiful artwork that I, it's not just natural resources for me to make a buck off of. If you're taking the kingdom of God seriously, you look at peace and reconciliation and conflict and war in a very different way. Uh, it's easy if you're in the kingdoms of this world to bomb people and kill people and uh, throw them in prison and throw away the key. If you're part of the kingdom of God, you can't treat other people that way. You have to look at it from a new perspective, a new point of view, higher point of view. Jesus said things like, if you give a cup of cold water to somebody in my name, if you see someone who's in prison and you go to visit them, if you see someone who's naked and you give them clothing, if you welcome a little child, you know, in those moments, God's will is being done on earth because God cares about that little child and God cares about that forgotten person in prison. When somebody loves their enemy, they're living by the way of the kingdom. In, on the human level, people see an enemy and they hate them. You love your friends, you hate your enemies. But when people love their enemies, they're manifesting the kingdom of God. When rich people decide that they're not going to use their wealth and power to keep aggrandizing themselves and improving their own portfolio. But when they reach a point, they say, gosh, I have enough. And there are people in such need. Now I'm going to use my money and my time and my energy and my voice and my vote on behalf of people who are suffering and poor and oppressed and forgotten. At that point, I'm not just a citizen of this world. At that point, I'm acting as a citizen of God's kingdom. I'm living out the way and the teaching and the example of Jesus. Those are some of the things, some of the ways the kingdom of God is a liberating and yet disturbing uh, message for people today. 